And so it was said that if the pillars of the world shall fall, darkness will descend upon all that lives. From the Book of the Dark, man did not heed this warning. The sacred cosmic tree burned to cinder. And so the darkness came, claiming all that was bright and living in fear. When all hope was lost, after a century without light, the sun rose once more. Thea awakened from her dark slumber, and you along with her. But Thea is not the world that once was. The age of darkness weakens, but it is far from over. Life took its shy roots, yet death will not release its grip easily. While the sun keeps some of the evil in check during the fleeting days, at night the creatures of darkness roam free and angry, unwilling to give up their dominion over the land. It is up to you to find a way to rebuild Thea, banish the darkness, and strengthen mankind. Ladies and gentlemen, hello, good evening, and welcome to a very long overdue Let's Play series. We're going to be playing Thea the Awakening with the Return of the Giants and all the other DLC. You can see all the giants returning in the background there. Oh, man. The giants scare me. So welcome to Thea the Awakening. This is a charming, lovely little indie game based in a lot of Slavic mythology and folklore. Um, we're going to be taking on the role of a deity protecting some struggling group of survivors and trying to find a way to deal with the darkness, the darkness that took over the world for a hundred years and has just now receded a tiny little bit for the first time in a century. The sun is finally out and we're gonna we're gonna capitalize upon that and try to, you know, save the world. So I went over, you know, the deity system a little bit and I went over our difficulty and, and how I'm customizing the difficulty in a previous video, a little setup video. I'm not going to, you know, go watch it if you're interested in that stuff. If you're not, then suffice it to say, I'm playing on a fairly hard difficulty and we're starting with a bunch of craftsmen. We're playing as Perun, the god of thunder, the god of the skies, the, the boss god, the one who's in charge of the pantheon, the last one that you're going to unlock in the game. So let's get into it, shall we? Thea is awakened. Welcome. No time to waste. You are a deity of the High Pantheon, and you must help your worshippers survive the darkness. So what now, you ask? You are divine, yes, but you have little power, and so you will know the world through your people's eyes. This means sometimes you will encounter your own divine messengers, and maybe even face your own avatars. Weird, I know. Your first mission is to survive. Every critter is trying to make sure you stay down. So get food and craft better equipment to protect yourselves. You will guide your people to victory, either by sheer survival and progress, or by solving the Cosmic Tree's mystery. All right, I hope you don't mind the narrator. I could mute him or turn him off. I'm not going to. I love the narration in this game. So this is Theodore. He's going to walk us through the tutorial for the game. Um, I've done it a bunch. Uh, you know, I don't need to do it. You still have some tutorial bits that you kind of have to do to get the story rolling anyway, even if you try to skip the bulk of it. Uh, we'll, we'll go through it, though. So what is this? Who Who is talking to me? What are you? You're a weird little, like, demon. You have goat hooves and wings, and you look grumpy i don't know you're are you frowning at me is it just because i'm asking so many questions should i stop asking questions what do you mean looking through our people's eyes i am but a messenger theodore you can call me but let us focus on you Thea is a broken land the underworld is shut and the undead roam the earth and creatures of darkness that ruled for a century want you dead Okay, so we need to survive, and then we need to, you know, <laughs> deal with the darkness that has ruled over the land for a century. Easy peasy. How do we get started? Where should we start? First, go and explore your village. 
Check the inventory to see your stocks and set people to gather food and fuel, like wood. Without food, people will starve. And without fuel, they will not craft or even heal. So these are really important. All right, food and wood. Got it. What else? Yes. Once you've visited your village, check out the people standing outside. The exploring party. Select your party and send them to me. I will wait for your people outside the village. I have marked your people's map with a big blue question mark so they will see where I am. Oh, and if you ever forget what your current task is, just check out your logbook. Okay, food, fuel, gotta gather those things, and then send people to go continue the tutorial. Got it. So we will now enter the minds and bodies of our worshippers and begin our adventure. So, welcome to the game. There's a, a hex grid here. It is a turn-based tile hex grid game. It's going to look kind of a bit like Civilization, if you've ever played that, or, you know, a lot of other 4X games. Um, it's, it's not, though. That's about where the similarities start and stop. So... The game is a hybrid of colony management. We've got to manage our little settlement here, grow food, craft buildings, arm our people, defend the city from monster attacks, that sort of thing. We're going to do a bunch of that. Um, there's also the, the party here that we've got that we're going to be exploring with. We're going to be moving around, exploring. There's a... Let's, let's take a look. Whoops, I didn't actually mean to move you guys. Well, whatever. There's a spider's nest right there that we just uncovered. There's like ruins of some sort over there. Ruins here. We can see them a little bit in the fog of war. There's something up there, like another spider nest probably. Yeah, a bunch of spider nests. Lots more ruins to go explore. Just little things. There's something different from the other type of ruin. Interesting. That's like maybe a tree, a cave, a mountain. Something. I don't know. There's stuff that we're going to go explore. We have our people here. They're going to be leveling up. There's uh, an experience meter here. We only need nine experience. We got one just for, you know, talking to Theodore at the start. There's research that we're going to be doing. We're going to be researching how to harvest new materials so we can learn about fur leather, which is a better type of leather than just, you know, regular boring leather. We know about iron. We know about a lot of these things at the start here. You can see the ones that are colored in have the little green check mark. Uh, so we know that, like, we, we, we know iron, we know that it exists, we know how to harvest it, we know where we can find it. We know that steel and gold also exist, and silver. Um, we don't know how to get those, we don't know where to get those, necessarily. There's something else further up this tree, so as we spend more points we can unlock things later on. Um, these will be used to craft both buildings in our settlement, and to craft better weapons and armor or tools for our people, maybe like crafting better tools for our blacksmiths so that they can craft even better things. Um, these are the actual recipes for things that we can make in town. We can make some food. Um, we can learn how to make baked foods. We can learn how to make roasted foods. We'll get into those in a bit. We'll come back to them. Um, weapons and armor should be fairly self-explanatory. You know, we're going to need these things to survive, to fight off monsters. Buildings. We know how to make a building right now, the pasture. Again, we have realism turned on. I discussed this in the previous video. I'll stop referencing that one soon, I promise. Um, we can make a pasture, just one. Um, there's other buildings we can learn. The cabbage field, there's a herbalist's hut, there's a well, there's a watchtower. There's other things beyond here that we could learn to, to make a smithy. All sorts of very good things here. We only have one research point, but we'll earn more as we play the game and do things. Um, first things first, we're going to follow what Theodore said. We're going to take a look here in Astoya. Uh, I will be renaming our village. I will be renaming our people. So if you want to, to be in the game, you want me to rename a character or something after you, just, you know, put it down in the comment section and I'll see what I can do. Um, this video right here that I'm recording, this is the first one. We'll just kind of get it out there and, and have a video. It's going to be great. Uh, and then I'm going to wait a couple of days before I record the next one, so there's going to be a bit of a gap between this one and whatever the next one is, so that we have a chance to get some names in here. I'm also accepting names or suggestions for renaming our settlement Astoria. Astoria is the default name that you always get. I would love to change it. I have some ideas, but, you know, let me know what you think. Um, we can look and we can see that they have three people in Astoria. They don't have any food right now. They have zero turns worth of food and they have zero turns worth of fuel for the fire. And that's what these icons down here are warning us about as well. As our adventuring party, we'll rename the expedition as well. 
Uh, they have six people. They've moved a couple spaces, so they only have three hexes left of movement. They also have no turns worth of food. They have no turns worth of fuel. And they have uh, a bunch of stuff they're carrying around, all their gear and whatnot that they're they're hauling around with them. There's a, a carrying capacity for them. That generally doesn't come into play too often, but, you know, it might. So we're going to go, you know, follow the tutorial. We're going to pop into Astoria here. We're going to just take a look. There's stuff that we can gather. There's a little gathering radius here. This is an interesting start. Oh, before we do this, there's one thing I want to point out. This is not in the actual difficulty settings, but it makes the game a lot more difficult or a lot easier, just depending, and it doesn't alter your score or anything. I have turned on the show unresearched resources. This is, in my opinion, very, very, very important. It makes the game a lot easier and a lot better and helps you helps to guide your decisions a lot more. So what that means is um, all the things that we can research that we don't actually like have yet. So we we know that dark wood exists and that we could learn about it and we could learn to harvest it. We know that elven wood exists. We have no idea what these other types of wood are. These will not show up on the map because we don't even know what they are. These things can show up on the map so we can see them. So before I invest my research points that are going to be fairly tough to come by, we can actually look at the resources and see, aha, there is some nearby elven wood. So getting a point in elven wood, learning how to harvest that like early, like right now, would actually maybe be very beneficial for us because we know that there's some very close to our settlement. So I will probably do that. There's veggies, seaweed, more seaweed, fish, um, herbs, regular boring just trees, just lumber. There's like some nuts here. I believe that's what that is. Yep, nuts. So we got some good stuff like right just around Astoria here, which is pretty cool. Um, if we go back into Astoria, just the one one tile radius. They can't gather and harvest very far. And basically that means we have a really, this is like a really unfortunate start for a settlement because they can only harvest exactly two things. It is the veggies and the wood. Man, that's a garbage start for us, but you know, we're gonna, we're gonna deal with it. We have our three people here. We have two gatherers and a crafter. It looks like we can actually just take a look at them here. Let's go look at you. So we have Viola. She is a gatherer. She starts with a hatchet. We have Vladimira. I'm so bad at pronouncing these Slavic names. She is also a gatherer. We have a very heavy hammer that nobody can actually wield, it looks like. Their strength dictates their their carrying capacity. Yeah. Wow, we have a very, very heavy two-handed stone hammer that nobody can wield. This is great. We'll maybe give it to one of our, like actual warriors in the adventuring party um but we start with a tiny little bit of gear so we have we have a couple people here we need to get them working on stuff so viola a bit of a good bit of gathering actually so the way it works is she has seven seven gathering skill and so we're going to multiply that by five and so she is contributing 35 points of gathering every turn to the veggies here and we need 54 points to bring in a harvest of vegetables a harvest of vegetables will be 14 units 14 actual you know carrots or whatever um okay so every every other turn she'll be bringing in 14 vegetables that's good that's gonna be our food um similar sort of thing here it's gonna take three turns to bring in seven wood and we're going to burn one wood as fuel each turn. So we'll slowly be gaining wood. It's going to be slow. I would like to do something about that. Boost your gathering ability as quickly as possible. Um, uh, so, like I said, it takes their their points, their like whatever their gathering skill is, and multiplies it by five here to see how much they can contribute. That's only for the first person in the larger portrait here. There are helpers, these four smaller boxes, and the helper contributes half so it would be half of what they would normally contribute so she's adding we can have her add 10 to like the vegetables for example or we could have her add the full 20 to wood so gatherers and helpers is a thing we have to keep in mind i'm gonna have to do a lot of math as we get you know focused on gathering later on um, i just want to point that out now so i don't have to remember it and talk about it later um, we don't have enough resources to build a pasture we don't have enough resource to make any better tools or anything we could maybe make some clothes for people give them a little tiny bit of armor 
make some cooked meals. The benefit of the meals is um, how well, like whatever resources go into it. We can take a look at this right here. So we're gonna do two meat, two meat, and then some firewood as a catalyst. So we're putting in four meat, and we're getting uh, eight pieces of jerky out of it. So we're turning four food into eight food. Also, the jerky is lighter, so if our adventuring parties are carrying food around, they will have more room, more inventory space for other things. So cooking food or baking food or whatever gives you a very good return on the raw resources. It stretches them a lot further um, and also just is helpful for when you're traveling around. There's also bonuses to having a large variety of food. Your characters will get stat bonuses and things as long as they're eating from a variety of food. So that's also very good. Um, I'm not going to burn our very, very precious wood making jerky just yet. Let's at least get a little more. Um, I know it's not contributing a whole ton, but, you know, add a whopping one point of gathering to the wood, I guess. <laughs> it's just really, it's just so the game won't prompt me with like, hey, there's a character not doing anything. I, I, it, I don't care. We just kind of have to get our feet under us for right now. Um, we also need to manage our supplies. I need to tell them that they can eat the meat that we're starting with and they can burn the wood for fuel that we have. So we have 18 turns worth of food for these three people. And we have five turns worth of fuel. Um, if you're not burning fuel, then I think you will like take damage and not recover your health and stuff. And it, it just, it gets real bad. You don't ever want to be in that situation. Same with food. Your people will starve. Bad news. Don't let these run out. Um, the reason that none of these were selected by default is, again, in the options, I have a setting. It's right here also. Allow the use of new items. Whenever they bring in a new thing, they will just immediately allow or not allow it. I don't like them allowing it. Like, I, I don't like them just automatically using new things. What if we find, like, a really rare piece of, like, elven wood or dark wood or something that we don't know how to gather yet? I don't want them just burning that for fuel, especially if we have actual other wood that they can use instead. Like, don't use this. Just use this. This stuff is rare and we should use it to craft. This stuff is just everywhere. It's literally growing off of trees out in the world. So Astoya, they're they're just going to be harvesting stuff, trying to deal with that situation. We're going to take a look at our adventures here. We have a hunter, we have two warriors, and we have three crafters because we started with a lot of crafters. Same sort of thing. First things first. You can eat your food. You can burn your wood. They're only going to burn the wood when they're camping, when they're, you know, marching around every turn. They're not going to be using wood. They will be eating, though. So that's a thing to keep in mind. They've also got 10 dark wood. Um, let's take a look at your guys' inventory. Carrying around some iron. I don't really know why, but sure. Um, all these characters are going to have some stuff. So our hunter has a poor quality spiky club. It does one damage. Or it adds one damage to her, her stats. So your damage is also derived from your strength, so raising your strength will also increase your damage. So 10 blunt damage is actually not terrible to start with. She has a battle slingshot. It's crude and ugly, but it almost shoots straight, and you can always hit someone with it, like a club. Um, range damage is actually, that's actually pretty good. That's actually a really good thing to start with. Huh, interesting. She has some armor. She has a bit of shielding. Um... A lot of the combat stats and things, we'll talk about them when we get into combat. I also talked about them a bit in my combat tutorial video that should have gone up around the same time as this one. We have a big old wooden training sword. We have a, a rib cage shield. Okay. You have a two-handed sword. That's cool. Ref uh, Repia? I wanted to call you Refia, but your PHs are not together. Repiha? Repiha? Don't know. Again, terrible at pronouncing things. I apologize. Um, wooden ring, sturdiness and folklore, a little bit of blunt damage on your club. Just a normal quality club, so it gives you two damage instead of only one. And you got a sword, and you have a amber runestone giving you a willpower. All right, so we just had like some you know random stuff that we're starting with. Uh, we should continue Theodore's tutorial. I'm gonna move them here to Astoria though, real quick. Let's take a look at things. Um, oh, we also have some kids. We have some string back in Astoya. We have a bit of leather and some clay. Like, we have some resources here. You guys can have the dark wood. Just leave that all in Astoya. We're going to maybe craft with it or something later. Not yet. The child, not too helpful right now, but one day it'll grow up. We have three kids. They will grow up into adults, and we'll get to pick a class for them, which will be real cool. It'll just happen when it happens, you know. 
Um, yeah. The only other thing I might want to do... And by the way, all these stats and things, there's a lot of them. We'll cover them as we need them. Uh, gathering is the most important one. We've already talked about that a little bit. You can filter your stats here, which makes it a lot easier to look for specific things, compare stats on characters, kind of just get through this. Dob Rasulka, I'm going to leave her here. I would like to have her in our expedition because she's a good fighter. I want to see if you can significantly contribute to bringing in resources here. Yeah, hitting the wood for a lot more seems important. Wait, what? Why are you doing double? Is it times 10? I'm very confused. Oh, it's times 10. Okay, right. Okay, I was wondering if the math was different because we were playing... I, I have changed the difficulty settings a little bit, scaled up the economy and whatnot. No, it's times 10. It was halved. It was only times 5 because we had no food. We had we were we were set to not eat and to not have um, firewood. So now it's back up to times ten. Okay, so it, the the math and the numbers still work out the same. It's still full contribution here, halved here, but it's times ten because we are actually have food and firewood now. So you'll be bringing in a full set, stack of vegetables a turn, and now you can bring in a full stack of wood per turn. We'll do this for a couple of turns. Th these numbers look a lot more correct. <laughs> oh man, I was I was worried, but. Phew, now I could talk about how weird I was because it's in the past. Haha, <laughs> jokes on you, past me. Forgetting how this game works, even though we've poured hundreds of hours into it. Um, yeah, okay, so now we'll bring in a full stack of veggies in a turn and a full stack of wood in a turn. This will get us a, just a lot of stuff right away. And then once we have a, enough firewood and enough like vegetables, we can start crafting actual food. That'll be good. That'll be very good. So... Yeah, I still want to leave our hunter here just to help with that for a couple of turns. So that'll be fine. Um, so our expedition here, before we visit Theodore's tutorial, which we are going to have to do, I want to just stomp around here a little bit, do a little bit of exploration, see what we've got around us, see what resources are around us. Because, yeah, we're probably going to invest our research point in getting the elven wood, because it's right there, and that's a pretty helpful thing to have early on. But, you know, if there's, like, gold or something just right over here, or, like, scaled leather over here or something, that might change what I want to go for right away. So, we can't move anymore. We're going to pass the turn. Um, I guess I should go over what all these buttons and things are down here. This is the resource toggle. I'm also just going to use the hotkey for it, and we're going to see that a lot. Um, it shows us the resource icons all over the map for everything that's within our vision. Um, we can toggle between our, our village and our groups. When we have more than one group, that'll be very handy. Even when we have just the village and a group, I'm going to be using that a lot. This is just a jump to the settlement screen. So we can just hop here. We can see what we're going to be crafting. We can see, you know, what's the construction queue, how many turns to bring in things. We have four people gathering stuff right now. One turn for veggies, one turn for wood. Um, you know, all of this fun stuff. Oh, I should have taken the hammer, too. <sighs> All right, don't let me forget that. We're going to come back to it. Um, this is our log for our quests. Theodore told us, like, hey, yo, your quests are going to be in here. So we'll use that every now and then. Research screen, we've already seen this as well. Um, only other thing is this. That's our god, Perun. If we click on it, we can see, like, our, our progress, what's going on. Uh, finish the god's main quest to win the game. So this is our victory conditions. We can see progress towards the giants quest the giants return of the giants was dlc for this game so it's kind of an end game addition an extra story quest a whole bunch of extra events and things that can happen new monsters new characters all sorts of cool stuff uh hopefully we get to see it i'm sure we will um as an alternative to the story you know we can we can try to figure out what's caused the darkness to take over the land why is the underworld shut how come ghosts and things, you know, spirits can't pass on, so the world's getting clogged up with all these undead zombies and skeletons and ghosts and things. Um, demons are, you know, floating around the world. It's, you know, bad news bears. And we can try to deal with that and solve it and figure out why the gods were powerless to stop it. And how come Perion isn't flying around throwing thunderbolts and driving back the darkness himself? Why is he just kind of 
meekly inhabiting these seven villagers that are seven, nine, however many we started with, whatever it was. You know, what's, what's changed? What's going on with that? Or we can just, you know, survive. Just build a settlement, get some good defenses, have a lot of people, research a lot of technology, build some really big, beefy buildings out of very expensive and fancy resources, fight off a bunch of really big, scary things like dragons and rock trolls, and kind of kind of just solidify our presence here. Hey, guess what? That's an advancement victory. You can just win by doing that instead. Uh, I almost always hit the advancement victory before I finish the actual story quest. We can look at our difficulty settings here, too. Again. Um, I almost always finish the advancement victory before getting to the gods quest, just because it's like the uh, Skyrim open world sort of problem. Like, here's the main story quest. Great. I'll come back to it when I'm max level and have done literally everything else in the entire game. Then we'll move on to step two of the, the story quest. You know. You know how it is. Um, that's That happens in this game, also. Um... Oh, last thing up here is the, uh, like, day-night cycle tracker. So right now, it is daytime. It is turn one. Um, the sun is coming up. So the moon has gone down. The sun is coming up. So we're kind of, you know, early morning entering into the day. At night, our vision radius decreases and the monsters get a lot more aggressive. So we got to keep those things in mind. Um, but it's not like one turn is day, the next turn is night or... Anything like that. It's more like, you know, 10 turns a day, 8 turns a night, something like that. I don't know. I don't know the exact numbers. I've never bothered to count. So we're going to pass the turn. Monsters can move around during the day. They don't always. And then we get the little notifications up here. Get used to seeing these a lot. We have an unspent research point. Thank you, game, for reminding me. And then some stuff was gathered. So we can click on it and see. In Astoria, we gathered 14 vegetables. We have a grand total of 14 in the village now. We gathered seven wood. We have a grand total of 11 in the village right now. Because seven plus five is 11 when you factor in the fact that, you know, we have to use one each turn in the settlement as fuel for keeping our people going. They're, they're down in one place. You can see that lovely fire burning in the middle there. We got to make sure that that stays burning. Um, I'm actually going to pop into a story real quick. Now that we're harvesting vegetables, you guys can just always eat vegetables. Always, 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 that's fine. Um, meats. We're actually going to turn off the meat for now, and we're going to save it for when we can start crafting better foods. Uh, the game thinks we're close to starvation, and, you know, I guess technically we are, but they'll, they'll be fine. They're gathering more. Ooh, okay. So we have the spider nest here, and then here we have a nest of the hungry unliving. So that's going to be like a zombie nest um and the reason they're nests is because they're going to spit out little like roaming bands of creatures specifically at night but they, they can do it at any time so we probably want to go shut those down sooner rather than later um oh wow we have coal right here too huh that's really good that's really lucky uh, and then there's some cherries alternate food source and then quartz pretty good building material for making like actual buildings and things actually that would be really good early on huh we might want to go for that we might want to get some quartz and start harvesting that as soon as we can and then this hex here is red that means there's monsters on it that are going to be moving around so uh, and then this is just like a little some ruins we can go explore they don't necessarily have monsters in them they might they probably do We'll check that out here. And then we're going to hit Theodore's tutorial here pretty soon. I just want to kind of see what's immediately around us. Yeah, so this is some unliving. There's two broken skeletons and one unliving corpse in there. We'll fight them off in a moment. Um, we're going to go explore these ruins here. So yes, there's a, a thing here. We can interact with this location. Let us do that. You stumble across some ruins of an old city, engulfed in mist and mystery. Okay. We can ignore them or we can search them. We will search them. Um, the game also shows a lot of these... You know, there are some options that are unavailable. It's it, it's not always... So sometimes it's like, hey, there's a thing that you could do here. You just don't meet the requirements for it. You could go in ex and explore it stealthily. You could try to set up an ambush rather than just fighting the things. You know, stuff like that. Sometimes. Sometimes it's just random. Like, there will be one search option and another search option, and they'll be functionally, like, they'll, they'll look identical, but one of them will randomly give you an encounter with some skeletons, and another one will just give you some loot with no encounter. 
we don't know which one we have. They look identical. It'll be a one skull challenge. There's a scale of one to five. And then one to five beyond that when we start dealing with giants. Oh, giants are bad news. Um, they're going to be a, a long ways away, though. Um, yeah, so one to five is the difficulty. One is the lowest, you know, easy peasy. So, yeah, what is what is this search option? What is it going to do for us? You open one of the buildings, a strange-looking stone and metal built affair, and you hear a clunking noise, then a blunt thud. Before you are able to do anything, you see a skeleton charging your way. So there we go. We got to fight a skeleton. Ooh, one non-broken, a full-on skeleton and four hulking rats. That's five things. This is actually going to be tricky. All right, combat. Um, I have gone over a lot of the, the details of combat in another video, a little combat tutorial video. Um, if you're really interested in the mechanics of how this works, then, you know, go watch that. I'm not going to, like, super go into exactly the details of how everything works and what the different symbols and statuses mean and, you know, what, what are all the different stats that matter and stuff like that. I'll talk about it a little bit, but I'm mostly going to be justifying, like, like my reasoning for doing things. We gotta go first. Um, interesting. We have a first action option available here. Let's throw... S uh, we're gonna throw Terzi Bibor. Oh, I am not even gonna try to pronounce these names. We're gonna throw you down. Because he has poison, if we first action something up front and it hits the skeleton and ideally would punch through its armor, then we could hit it for two extra damage. Alternatively, on the first attack, we're going to hit it for nine. And then the next attack, we'll hit it for eleven. We're still going to need somebody up front. Thirteen and eleven will kill it, so maybe Snovit has to go up front. Hmm. We'll put you here, and then I'm going to have our other warrior get closer, because she has a fair bit of shielding. The hulking rats shouldn't be too much trouble. We're very lucky that this skeleton was a tactics card, so it came in confused. And that means they're not using the tactics on it, too. Yeah, you're going to do two damage, so we're not going to have to worry about taking too much damage here. Um, the one thing that I am genuinely worried about, though, is if this tactics hulking rat here has any stealth and if it can first action another rat move it up forward so i'm not going to play any of my cards until the very end and we're just going to toss down snovit and then we're going to first action him to the front um one major advantage blah, 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 one major advantage that comes from starting with a whole bunch of craftsmen a whole bunch of blacksmiths is that they typically have um good like soft skills like non-combat skills like, they're, they're not hitting for, you know, he's hitting for six damage, he has six health. So, like, not amazing in combat. Not by any stretch. But they're going to have, like, a lot of stealth. They're going to have some good attractiveness and speech. Um, a lot of things that warriors would generally be lacking on their own. So we have, like, a very well-rounded party. It means that we're not, like, amazing at any given one thing. But, you know, we should be able to do pretty okay with whatever the game wants to throw at us early on here. Um, yeah, so we're just, we're gonna pass this turn for now. I'm not gonna like just end things and let them play out all the cards. I still wanna play mine. We're just gonna, I wanna see what that tactics card is. That's the one that worries me here. Um, also, five, 10, you're gonna take 10 damage. So, Modliboga, Modliboga, she's gonna actually take some damage. She's gonna take some wounds here but I think we'll be okay. It's not a lot. Although I guess it depends on what what the tactic is. Okay. Good. So this is fine. We're taking out the skeleton early. That's the one that I'm by far the most worried about. It has the most health. It does the most damage. It's just dead. Dead skeleton. We don't have to worry about it. Sadly, Refia can't kill the rats. That's okay. And then our warrior's gonna take some damage, so she's down to 23 health. She's gonna actually get a wound or two from this fight. But other than that, we should win quite handily. 
whopping one point of damage carried over because of the blunt damage aspect. Let's search the buildings and discover a supply store still intact. Okay. Um, cool. So we got a buckler. We can take a look at any of these right now. So we can see that it weighs 94. It is one-handed thing. It's a shield, right? You're, it goes in one hand. An iron buckler. It may be simple and a bit ugly, but it does what it says on the tin. Um, we can see it was just made from iron and leather. So we can look and see, like, you know, was it made using very good resources? Or is this just, like, default, low-level, tier 0 or tier 1 materials? Like, the, the low stuff, you know? Iron and leather. This is, like, something that we could theoretically make. It's okay, though. Four armor. Um, for, so, I haven't really talked about how armor works in the game. It's different from health and from shielding. It's kind of in the middle there, but this also has four shielding. One dexterity. I'll talk about the armor here in a moment when we can look at a character. Um, this is a gathering tool. This is really good. This will just add two points of gathering to someone. So... Um, if we give this to our other gatherer back in the village, back in Astoya, the one that was only the only had a gathering of like two or something, four, what did she have? She had four, I think. This will bump her up to six, so she'll be able to one-shot the wood and just bring in a bundle of wood every turn without needing the hunter. So then we can put the hunter back in our exploration party here. So that that's good. That solves one of our big problems right now. We can just get our hunter out. And then we got some iron, we got some granite, and we got some fish, which is, you know, fish or food. And then we gained a wound. Wounds are how much damage you've taken. Those are bad. Those are very bad. Wounds, um, when you get below like half HP or so, your character has a good chance of dying. The way you recover wounds is you camp or, you know, drop somebody off in the settlement, which is like a permanent camp. Um, or you have like a medic in your crew who can help heal people, you know, while you're marching around and whatnot. Um, we don't have a medic. We could camp. It's only one wound. Now, in combat, she had, like, 25 health or something, but here she only has 11 max HP. And the way it works is you have your actual, like, HP for your villager. These are generally going to be very low values. And then from whatever armor you have equipped, so she has bone spike armor, gives her 12 armor. Your health in combat is your character's HP plus their armor value of whatever they're wearing. So um, 11 plus... 12 plus probably some from the shield yeah so that's how we get to our 25 and so um we took two damage to it to our, our character's 25 health see and it you can see the total of 25 armor and it's a total of 25 because it is it is your armor stat plus your actual hp so it already does the math for you right there um we took some damage but we only gained one wound because armor is basically like a buffer so it helps you like reduce the number of wounds you're going to take when you actually take damage in combat. It's very, very good. Very important. Like if Refia got hit and took two damage, he has no armor. He, his armor is his health. So if he took two damage, he gets two wounds. That's awful. We saw our warrior took two damage, only got one wound. So, you know, high armor, very, very important. Um, that's kind of all I'm going to say on that. If you have specific questions about specific stats and things, they'll probably be addressed as we play. But, you know, put them in the comments if you are actually curious about how something works. Hey, you took two damage, you only got one wound, what is the deal with that? Stuff like that. I would be happy to explain what's going on, because the game's not super clear about all those things. Um, We're going to hit the spider's nest here to clear it out. I kind of want to go clear out the hungry and living too, because that's close. And then we'll head back to Astoya, we'll grab the hammer and equip that on somebody, probably, and we'll drop off the gathering tool, we'll take our hunter back, we'll do all that stuff. And then we'll probably call it quits before we get into Theodore's tutorial. Save that for the next video. So we are approaching the spider's nest. If we had other other things, if we had a particularly sneaky or tactical party, we could try to like ambush the spiders or poison them or who knows what. Um, we don't have any other options available right now. We can fight or we can just leave. We're going to fight the spiders. There are four level one wimpy militia spiders. These are just fodder. This is fighting rats in the sewer in an RPG. You got to do it. You got to eat your vegetables. It's really not that big of a deal. Um, same thing. We're going to open with... Actually, we're going to open with Refia because he can do six damage, and if the spiders have low enough HP, he can hit multiples. Maybe even kill more than one spider. That blunt damage is very, very, very helpful. 
Yeah. So this one has four HP, so he'll do four damage to this one to kill it, and then two damage to whatever comes in next. And then we'll play our warrior as like a buffer. She'll hopefully tank any... Oh, actually, we can put Betamir as well. So we're killing one, doing some damage to the... Oh, never mind. Well, two can play at that game. Actually, you know what? We'll just confuse that one. And then if we still need to, we can first action to move Betamir up to the front to kill this spider first. I don't think we'll need to, but we're, I want to wait and see what that tactics card is right there. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter what he does. We, we have won the fight, so we're going to hit something. Oh, hit this one. Yeah, he killed both of them. Oh, that's perfect. We got really lucky there, and then we got to attack the discard pile. Yep, and it's done. We've killed all the spiders. We got a wooden training sword. Another one. Um, not amazing, other than the fact that it's one-handed. It's always 90. It's kind of light. I don't know. We could maybe give it to one of our gatherers or something back in Astoya. That's the end of that turn. You can see we're gaining experience for all these fights. The experience is global. Every single character that you have will level up all at the same time when this fills. So getting new characters later on in the game, they're just always going to be lower level than your starting characters because, you know, these are the ones get, that are going to be around getting all the experience through the whole game for as long as I can keep them all alive. Um, so we'll send all the resources back over into Astoria. I'd like to grab some veggies. Don't know if we can really afford to do that just yet. Uh, let's see. So let's do that. You have seven gathering. You have four. Oops, so we're going to deal with equipment and stuff here. Um, you can you can pass items back and forth on the inventory screen, which is pretty helpful. You can also toggle between other parties, like if we had another expedition here at the same time or something. So it's kind of helpful. A bit a bit clunky sometimes when you have like a third party and you're trying to juggle items between all three of them. But a very helpful screen. You're going to see it a lot. Um... I'm not super keen on only having three people and none of them warriors back here in Astoria. If we do get attacked by monsters in the middle of the night, that could be a bit scary. Um, let's let's leave the weapons with them. Um, our adventure is going to be out getting you know more weapons and armor and things as loot for these fights. As you've seen, we've already done that a couple of times. So I'm okay with them not being like super optimally equipped right now. The villagers have nothing in Astoria, so I'd like to deal with them. Um, let's get this hammer on somebody first, though. Our warriors are going to be able to carry the most stuff. And, um, yeah, this is as good a time as any to get into it. All the weapons have different properties. There's generally going to be four types. There's going to be um, swords, axes, hammers, and spears. And there's, like, one or two-handed swords, one or two-handed axes, uh, one or two-handed hammers... Spears, there's like basically weak, weak two-handed spears and good two-handed spears. Um, they all have their own properties. Swords have an inherent amount of shielding, so they do pretty good damage. And then they have shielding also, so very good at giving to people to, you know, beef up their armor and their health for combat. You know, I mean, it's giving them shielding, not necessarily armor and health. Um, shields do the same thing, armor and shielding. So good for helping people to survive in combat. Good, like, defensive weapons. Axes have the highest damage of anything. Axes are just always going to do the most damage. An axe made out of some materials will do more damage than any other weapon made out of the same or comparable materials. Obviously making like a crappy iron axe is not going to be as good as making like a super sweet obsidian sword or something, but you know, comparable materials, axes will do more damage. Um, but they don't add any sort of defensive benefit. They're just a lot of damage. That's it. Hammers are... Um, an okay amount of damage, not usually the best, but the big thing they, they provide is blunt damage, so you can hit through one enemy and do damage to a second enemy if you kill the first. So that's the big tactical benefit there. Spears, we'll talk about those when we get to them, because they're a bit more complicated. Um, those are generally the thing, that, you know, what to look for. One-handed weapons are going to have less damage, but, you know, you can equip like a shield or something, so that's pretty cool. Warriors have a very interesting property. They can equip two-handed swords in one hand. So you can have a two-handed sword, which I believe this is, yeah, a two-handed big training sword in one hand and also a shield. So warriors have, like, a special benefit going there. 
Um, they can't do like a two-handed hammer in, in one hand or anything. Uh, we're going to give you the hammer because I feel like you're the only one that can actually wield it. Yeah, you're dangerously close to being at your equipment limit. But that's good. So we now do 20 blunt damage. So if you remember those spiders that had like 4, 5, 6 HP, yeah, she can just kill two of them, period, in one turn, one attack. Real, real nice. And the one poison damage, that's something that exists. Uh, man, I hate all these bad quality items we've got to start with, but there's, you know, there's only so much we can do about that. Let's, uh, let's pass these back. I really want people in Astoya to be well-equipped, so we're gonna do that. And then anything that's left over that we can spare, we'll go back to the other group. Uh, each of these shields weighs 100, so, you know, give or take. So you're probably not gonna be able to do much with that. Maybe I give you this? You do a lot less damage, but you have a lot of shielding. Maybe you can have that? I don't know. The blunt damage is okay. Actually, you can have a shield too. This is, the buckler is really good. That's a really good shield. For, you know, being a, a not great starting shield, that's like one of the best not great starting shields we could have. And, um, without going into detail about what every stat does in the game, generally my approach to playing the game, the way that I recommend people play, you want to stack a stat. I would rather have one person with six dexterity and nobody else have any, rather than everybody have one or two dexterity. You really want to go all in on emphasizing character strengths. Having six stealth lets us affect cards up to level six when we're using that. Having several characters with two stealth is great when all your characters are level two or below, but as soon as you have a level three character or everybody's level three, you're going to wish that you had one very stealthy character instead of everybody having an unusable amount of stealth. So I really, 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 really am going to try to focus our stats. Um, the backstab is fine. You already have a point of backstab. So having that ivory bracelet for another point, great. We're just stacking that stat on one character. Um, you know, giving dexterity to somebody who has none. I mean, I'm not going to like avoid it but I would really rather stack the stat. Um, these are spare weapons, so we can give these back over to our warrior crew. We're only gonna have to do this sort of item shuffle, you know, a bit here at the start, and then maybe later on when we start making and getting really, really good gear. But for now, it's important that we just equip everyone well so that, you know, our settlement's fairly well protected while we're out exploring, and so that our, our stompy squad here can go successfully stomp on the bad guys. Um, this weighs a lot. You have a two-handed sword. That's okay. That's pretty good. Um, I would like you to have a shield. You're, you've been, like, startlingly squishy in combat. Three damage, five shielding. Two damage, four shielding. That small sword. That bad quality short sword is terrible. I could give you... I don't know. You're... Your six blunt damage is generally not going to be useful. It was a fluke that we used it on that spider fight. I think I'd rather you have the sword just because of the extra shielding. You don't have any armor, so the shielding will help a lot at keeping you alive. Um, and two blunt damage is just not amazing. We'll just leave that in Astoya and not carry it around, and it's, it's fine. It's just in Astoya. Nobody needs to have it. I think everybody in Astoya was actually equipped with a weapon. All three of you. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That is fine. Okay, so there we go. There's just a little little starting bit of The of the Awakening. The gameplay is not going to be this fuddly, fud, fuddly, fiddly. This fussy and fiddly combined into fuddly, apparently. Thank you, my brain. Um, it's not going to be like this fussy and this much administration in all the videos. Uh, we are going to have to do this every now and then, but it's going to generally result in being more condensed, like a lot of item in inventory management, and then we don't have to deal with it for a while. And then, you know, once our technology level catches up, a lot of item in inventory management, or, you know, as we get new characters and need to equip them and stuff like that. So there we go. There's a quick little glance at the game. Again, if you want somebody named after you, if you want to have your name attached to one of these characters in the game, comment down below. And if you have a good suggestion for naming Astoya, 
or for naming our different groups. We have Expedition 1 here. We're going to have to rename them to something, some sort of adventuring party type name. Um, you know, recommendations are welcome. And other than that, see you guys in a couple of days, and we're going to hit Theodore's tutorial and, you know, really get rolling on the game here. Thanks for watching, everyone. May the grace of the Twilight Dragon be with you.